a new life, a new life, a new life. We felt really like newborn. We are, for, I think we are forever grateful to the Welsh people for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. In 1948, uh, two years after the estate had been broken up by the 13th Earl of Dundonald, Grich was bought by a business entrepreneur called Leslie Saltz. And Saltz had the idea of turning Grich into a country house open to the public, which was quite... It was... It was quite innovational really because you had Longleat opening at the same time and um, another house so there's only three in Britain three big houses open to the public and um, he was trying to get people to come to Greek so he was looking for attractions and boxing was quite popular um, back in the late 1940s early 1950s so Saltz went and found Randolph Turpin who was training for um, his world title fight and um, he was brought into Greek and he came from Leventon Spa. He was a major, major pull for the crowds. Well, it helped me all around because the surroundings are nice and everything seems pleasant. Good. And uh, this Dougie Miller, he's been in America recently, hasn't he? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Will that have altered his style of boxing, do you think? Will he? No, I don't think so because I think uh, Dougie had got American style of boxing and I don't think they could show him anything over there because he knows his way around the ring pretty yeah. well. Well, you fought him about three years ago, didn't you? You beat him on point. Yes. How did you go on in that fight? Did you feel satisfied with it? Well, yes, I was satisfied because I was only raw then. I see. You've put a lot of training and a lot of work since then. You've beaten Robinson. You've fought Robinson twice. And you feel that with Miller that your extra experience will be enough to put pay to him this time too? Well, yes, I think so because I'm a lot more ring-wise now. Good. I think he was just born, you know, naturally as a box as, as a boy. You know, he was uh, a great, great amateur. I think you know, to, he had a hundred amateur uh, fights, winning ninety-five of them. He won three ABA titles and was British junior champion in the age of fifteen. So I think people spotted him from an early age that he was going to be a great champion, and he turned professional at eighteen. So he was. You know, he was he was there to be a champion. You know, it's a bit like Mike said. Um, I run two youth clubs, and we're always looking for new projects. And they're on the, on the internet, looking at um, boxing, and Randolph Turpin comes up straight away. You know, and they're doing printouts of of, of him and all the, all the stories that go with it. And then the next minute, they won a boxing club in the town because we didn't have one at the time. It closed down many, many years ago. And now we've got it up and running and it's over 150 youth are involved. There's been a lot of locals, um, older guys that have actually done bare knuckle fighting in Greece. So it wasn't just, you know, um, sh you know Randolph Turpin that had been there. And I, I know a lot of old guys that, that have done bare knuckle there. And I think most people um, you know, that were into boxing as professionals, they started their careers there. So it has it has quite a past actually, you know, with it. So um, I think you know if you, if you dig a bit deeper, you'll find quite a few old chaps that have been there. You know, so you know, I think uh, I think perhaps maybe that was one of the reasons he came there. Sure, we came here in 1972 uh, with a company from Nottingham to do the jousting tournaments, uh, which was great. I mean, this was the first season, really, that anything like this in this country had ever happened. I think all the big parks that are now Alton Towers and Chessington didn't really exist then. There was more as formal gardens. And so this was a real first for, for this country. And so there was a lot of buzz, there was a lot of media buzz. I mean, remember the first show that we ever did was to, was to the media, and all the television stations were there, all the top papers were there, and we rode in, and there was just a, a massive cameras there so they'd never seen anything like now it's just old hat but uh, um, you know it, it was big stuff in those days. What man could resist wearing half armour, chain mail with a sword and swanning round in front of hundreds of girls? What? Tell me a man who, who says he can resist it and I'll show you a man who's telling stories and it was wonderful I came here it was a good group 
everybody made things, you sorted your own equipment out, and we used to practice fights, sword fights in the corridor, and Richard stabbed me right in the forehead. I've got a little scar to this day where he stabbed me in, uh, I like to think by accident, but I'm pretty sure it was jealousy. It was absolutely brilliant. And bear in mind, I was 18 then, um, on the first year, and it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you, th what, what better job could you have? You know, the footballers, maybe they've got a better job. I don't, well, they certainly get paid more, but I don't think they've got a better job. I mean, we had a great job. I mean, it was, you dealt with everything. You dealt with the audience. You dealt with horses. You know, every show was different. You know, you were doing live action. There was fights and there's jousts. And all. It was brilliant. It was very, just, you couldn't wish for a better job. People say to me, used to say to me, when are you going to get a real job? I said, what do I want a real job for? I've got the job I want. Well, I first saw Grich when I was very young, I must have been a toddler, and I remember seeing this magnificent castle along the base of a hillside, and um, I remember one day, I must have been about three or four, going past at night in the winter, and there was a light on up there, and it always fascinated me why there was a light on, and um, I went up with, I think it was my father and grandfather, and I remember sitting on my father's shoulders and we went up, but we couldn't go up right up to the castle because it was boarded off and that must have been in the late 1980s. I see you set in the limestone, your towers standing strong, the wind whistling through, the rain hitting your stone. I see you set in the limestone, I go past and wonder, why does no one care? Dear Griff, I love you so. Like a legend from King Arthur's time, Grich Castle slumbers on the Welsh coast near Abergelly, keeping watch over Liverpool Bay. What an amazing place! It's got to be at least a thousand years old. Imagine in the Middle Ages, all those knights jousting and all those banquets. Uh-uh, it's a fake. It's a mock medieval castle built in 1815. And it's a grade one listed building and it's falling down. Luckily, young Mark Baker is single-handedly trying to save it. I've always been interested in history, like I read lots of books on the Tudors and the Stuarts, and I like just like going around country houses and like imagining how it was. As a result of an ownership dispute, Grich Castle has fallen into disrepair. It's been occupied and ransacked by New Age travellers. For the last 18 months, Mark's been campaigning to save it. He's tackled estate agents, lawyers and the public records office. Mark's badgered and nagged. He's even got the council to make emergency repairs. All right, Mark, let's have a look and see what's in here. Well, that's no way in. No, the council's blocked it up. That's certainly going to stop people getting in. Yeah. Everything started with a letter I'd written to the Prime Minister the Prince of Wales and um, the local authority and I remember going to photo uh, in, on, on a blank sheet of paper with all childish scrawled handwriting and uh, in a big black, um, not one of those um, green beryl italic pens to try and make my handwriting look better and um, photocopying that and sending it off to, to the three and um, I had replies back saying, sorry, you know, it's very sad, but we can't really do anything. So I thought, um, you know, you should try and get in touch with the local newspaper, which we did. And um, I wrote a letter to the editor and I was surprised that a reporter turned up at the door and they did a, a full page article on schoolboy wants to save the castle, which was... Uh, which is quite, it was quite funny really, because I didn't expect anything like that. I wasn't looking for any publicity. I just wanted to try and raise people's awareness, like, you know, people in, in power really, who should be doing something. Do you ever think you've taken on quite a big task here, trying to save this castle single-handedly? Yeah. You, are you surprised that it's turned into this? Yeah, I am really, because it just started with like, just a little piece in the paper saying, boys starts campaign to save castle and it's ended up on television. It was always in the back, throughout my life, and I think for many people in North Wales, it was always in the background and it was a backdrop to so many different things. And um, 
when I first went up there, you could walk around every room, which I did, but that didn't last for long because bits were quickly falling into dereliction. I remember up there one time, and we were in the building, there was a big crash, and um, I think there was some ceiling had collapsed or something, so it was it was pretty dangerous. And then, I didn't go up for a while, but it was in about 96, 97, I went up again, and... You could still walk around all the main rooms, but the upper floors were completely inaccessible. And the New Age travellers who were living on site had stripped out most of the floorboards. So you just had the joists and ceilings had been taken down and anything of any value had disappeared from the building, such as the marble staircase, all the fireplaces, all the windows, all the doors. It was, it was virtually being demolished. And um, I was so upset by that, that there was this wonderful piece of architecture which we'd been given, you know, this generation had been given it. And uh, in little more than, you know, two or three years, it had been turned into a skeleton, a shell of its former self. Countryfile has contacted the American owner and confirmed that he intends to sell the castle. If a suitable buyer can be found, then Grich Castle could be saved. I think it's fantastic. Something will happen now after 10 years. So you think this place will be restored yeah. to its former glory? if it gets sold. Are you looking forward to that day then? Yeah. Because then someone will own it who cares about it. Cares about it as much as you do? Yeah. kind of waiting for somebody to do what we're going to do to it. It was obviously in, in, good, in good condition with windows and roofs and the staircase was, was beautiful I mean, the statues up and everything. But what I'm, what I'm seeing now obviously is what everybody else is seeing and that's an absolute tragedy of, of dereliction. What I see now, I don't, I don't feel angry. What I, and what I actually am is excited because it will, it'll be a fantastic project for us and it'll be something to be incredibly proud of at the end of it. Um, it won't just be a case of um, I'm a developer, I've bought a, I've bought a castle, I don't really know what to do with it, all I know is I want a hotel, that, is, that isn't us. Um, I, in my head could walk you through most of the spaces in this place now as to the theme and the style that I, that I want for that and, uh, and, and could probably do a little sketch of what I think the likely cornice is going to look like and, and what ceiling strapping it's going to have and, and all that kind of stuff. This is, this is, this is exactly the, the kind of stuff that we, that we built the company up to, to, to achieve. Um, it, it's, um, it's a fantastic project and we're absolutely up for it, but no, it doesn't frighten us at all. It's uh, uh, just let us add it. We want to get in there and, and get it done.